Now let's take a look at a more flexible model for classification, neural networks. We will start off by looking at the limitations of the models we have already seen and introduce the concept of neural networks and how they fix these problems. We'll see the inspiration for their architecture and then finally go on to a more in-depth explanation of how the model works and how we can teach it. Nowadays, we call neural networks and variants on traditional neural networks deep learning because they are generally composed of stacks of shallow learning algorithms like linear regression or logistic regression. Generally, we want to use neural networks for nonlinear hypotheses. Consider the diagram presented. The optimal hypothesis function is curvy and clearly not linear. But you may be asking, we can achieve nonlinear functions in logistic and linear regression. We simply insert polynomial terms like x1 squared, x2 squared, x1, x2 squared, x2, x1 squared, x2 squared, x1 squared, etc., and achieve a high order hyperplane that can be projected down into a two dimensional plane as a nonlinear function. However, consider when we have not only uh, x1 and x2, but hundreds of features, x1, x2, all the way to x100. The number of polynomial terms grows combinatorially. For example, 5,000 features amounts to uh, 170,000 polynomial features for just an order of two. This is simply infeasible. In addition to this, we must try out different polynomial degrees, e.g. 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Here, the number of terms will continue to rise and rise, and we need to wait for training to complete it to select the most optimal one. However, neural networks can introduce nonlinear hypotheses in a much more robust way without introducing an exponential magnitude of new features that would drive up learning time. Lastly, neural networks make room for more complex types of learnings. For example, a type of neural networks called convolutional neural networks perform intelligent operations to classify images, as shown in module 5.1 and sorry 5.5. Logistic regression cannot produce the same results and it needs to deal with millions of different pixels as individual features. This doesn't make sense and makes learning impossible, as well as for poor results. Recurrent neural networks are another type of neural network which can do interesting things like even compute programs. Linear or logistic regression is just thought of as one component to neural networks. Neural networks are really stacks of the different shallow logistic models uh, to produce much more interesting models. Our brain has hundreds of billions of neurons divided into distinct regions responsible for various tasks. For example, the primary visual cortex takes signals from our eyes and performs preliminary processing by picking out edges or lines. From there, the signal travels to a different part of the brain to pick out shapes or objects. Those observations are then forwarded on to yet another region for decision making and so on. The brain can adapt the connections between these neurons to control how it makes choices and respond to different situations. And essentially, these weights control what the brain does. For example, researchers found out that they could switch the part of the brain in, the, in animals that controls the sensation of hearing, the auditory cortex, with the sensation of hearing, of seeing. And although at first the creature would be wildly disoriented, over time the auditory cortex would learn to see. This suggested that the brain may not be a complex library of intricate functions, but rather one complex model that could learn. Neural networks were believed to be just this. Support in philosophy was also evident, with many believing that emergentism, the idea that a sum of individual physical parts and components can give creation to a higher order mind, could explain via neural networks our higher order non-physical consciousness that we know as a mind. Thus, people took on the idea of neural networks and tried to implement them as models in machine learning. As it turns out, they became wildly successful. An artificial neural network uses a similar model to the one found in the brain. The network is divided into layers of neurons, and the data that you give is transformed layer by layer into a final representation. In the context of classification, the input might be an image, and the output might be the class of the image that the image belongs to. But neural networks aren't limited to just classification. They are, in fact, a universal function approximator. They will try to approximate any function you give it, whether it's a classification problem or a regression problem. Let's take a look at a concrete example. The first layer is the input layer. This is where we will give the network the input to the function that it is approximating. 
Then comes what we call a hidden layer or a series of hidden layers. Hidden layers are just layers that are not the input or output layer, but do intermediary processing. To go back to the brain al analogy, a hidden layer is like the primary visual cortex, which detects lines and edges, but passes that data along to the next region instead of acting on it directly. Finally, the output layer combines the output to the last hidden layer to give us the output we're looking for. In the diagram, each circle refers to a neuron, node, or activation, each term interchangeably used. Essentially, each activation stores one value or computation, usually, usually determined from the activations in the previous layer, multiplied with the weights uh, and activation functions, uh, which we'll discuss soon, uh, all except for the input in which values are actually inserted. Now let's look at a more formal definition. Each neuron in the neural network outputs a scalar value. In the input layer, that value is simply the input you feed into the network. Computing, uh, computing the outputs, which are also called activations, of the other neurons is a bit more complicated. Each neuron has a weight for the output of each neuron in the preceding layer. The weight, visually, is a connection from one neuron to the next. In a fully connected layer, each neuron in a layer is connected to each neuron in the next immediate layer. The neural network then multiplies each output from the previous layer by its respective weight and adds all of these multiplications up. Finally, it puts this composite into something called an activation function, which, ju which is just a nonlinear function that allows for more complex relationships and models to be uh, introduced. One such activation function that was uh, particularly popular uh, several years ago is the sigmoid function. Uh, and that turns any real value into, into a probability. Do you remember that from the logistic regression? If the fact that any of this work seems a bit magical, it's because we haven't really talked about how we get these special weights. If we think back to biological neural networks, the weights between the connections are what define what behaviors and choices are observed. And the same is true in an artificial neural network. We'll talk more about how exactly we learn these weights in a bit, but keep in mind that these weights are what control the neural network's behavior, and learning the model is as simple as finding the right set of weights for a network. What follows is the architecture of a neural network. As mentioned, each node is an activity or activation. Each weight connects one activity to the next, and we will see the mathematical procedure for this soon. Now, we can have one hidden layer, or we can have many hidden layers. The former is known as a shallow network, and one layer is simply equal to a logistic regression or linear regression unit. The latter is known as deeper models or deep learning. Generally, the more number of hidden layers you have, the more uh, complex and deeper your model is, and the more weights you need, uh, and the more ma mappings involved. And hence, the overall more complex function you get. You can also have a varied number of nodes in a hidden layer. The number of these uh, need not be constant throughout the neural net. Though we may have one output, we can also easily have multiple um, outputs, and we do not need to produce different models like in logistic regression. Lastly, for a classification algorithm, the outputs usually add up to want to create a probability distribution, and this is called a softmax layer. Though this need not always be the case, and remember that a neural network can just pretty much uh, produce any sort of function. Now let's look at how we compute one activity, or activation. Each activity will have some input going into it, and we will label this x. Each input source will have some sort of weights w, unless, of course, this is an input source, uh, as an, an input to the entire neural network, in which case w is just equal to 1. Now, the first thing we will do is compute the weighted sum of these inputs and weights, which equals to w transpose x, as you've seen in previous models. Then, we take this weighted sum and insert it into an activation function. An activation function is a function that introduces nonlinearity into our neural network, as discussed before. In fact, for classification tasks, we can use a sigmoid function as an activation function to achieve probabilities. On the other hand, we could simply stick a sigmoid unit at the end of the entire neural network and use something like the ReLU function instead uh, throughout the network. 
which is zero when x is smaller than zero and x when x is bigger than zero, bigger or equal to zero. Point being, there are different types of activation functions that we can use and in different places. Just like we can compute activities as weighted sums of direct input values and weights, we can compute activities of neurons at the hidden layer and the, at the output layer as a weighted sum of the previous activities that are connected to it and their connecting weights to the current activity. This shows how we combine two neurons to, uh, in one layer to create the value of the neuron in the next layer. Now, zooming out and looking at the neural network as a whole, we can see it as a stack of these individual layers of neurons, of which may be linearly activated or non-linearly, e.g. logistically activated. As seen in the first layer, since there are A inputs, and let's say there are B neurons in the hidden layer, you will have A times B weights, uh, and hence this is represented in matrix form. We denote this as W1, meaning the weight matrix at layer 1. W2 is a matrix uh, at, of the weights at layer 2, uh, and it just has one uh, column, as in it's a vector, since the size of the output layer is just one here. In our notation, HWB of X represents the output, and we want to compute it. We start the computation from the input layer, the subsequent neurons in between, until we reach the output layer. This computation of the outputs based on the inputs and intermediate processes is called the feed forward process. Here, we represent each hidden activation as AIJ, which equal to the activation, um, let's say that, for example, we're using sigmoid, of the weights multiplied by the activity outputs of the previous layer. Do not worry about the indices involved. What's important is grasping the intuition. You'll notice that we also have uh, plus one units at each layer, which connects to nothing else. Or sorry, which nothing else connects to, though it does connect to other neurons. Each plus one unit connects to other neurons, as mentioned. The weights for each plus one unit are considered bias terms, as in because they contribute to the weighted sum, but by multiplying by one, um, they essentially create uh, a constant input. So they vertically shift the weighted sum, because again, anything times one is equal to that value. This is a similar concept that we've seen in multivariate regression. So how do we train a neural network? Well, it's actually quite simple. We take the error function, which is either the same as logistic regression or a more simplistic version, for example, squared disc discrepancies, and then we calculate the derivatives for each individual weight in the network with respect to the error, or sorry, we calculate the derivatives of the error with respect to each individual weight in the network, and then we perform gradient descent where we try to find the minimum point of that error function for each weight. But here's the hard part, computing the derivatives. In shallow algorithms like logistic regression or linear regression, computing the derivative is simple, since the weights were isolated from each other and are weighted sums that were at most fed through one activation function. But in neural networks, note that we begin to stack each layer on top of the previous one. Weights in further layers are dependent on the previous ones, and the isolation no longer exists. If you look at the diagrams, to get the derivatives of the error with respect to the first weight, we must traverse from the error to each individual output until we reach the hidden unit, at which point we are right at W1. This is called backpropagation, and I'm sure you can understand why based on the diagram. Because neural networks are essentially one big composite function, it is no surprise that we must apply the chain rule many successive times to compute the derivatives from our errors to our early weights. Once all the derivatives are computed, we perform simple gradient descent. And that's it for the backpropagation algorithm. As discussed, artificial neural networks can create some very cool and complex nonlinear um, decision boundaries. Here are some great examples. Unlike logistic regression, where we would need to compute an insane number of terms, we can simply use a normal number of features paired with a larger set of weights and perform training on that. It works remarkably well, and there's a reason that neural nets and deep learning uh, are the hottest machine learning algorithms to date. Now, the previous slide showed some complex boundaries learned by just giving the normal features input. This is due to the feature learner hidden units. Depending on the final output, the hidden units in the hidden layers can learn complex features.
The image on the left shows a collection of inputs given to a digital, uh, digit, an OCR digit class, classifier, uh, which like detects uh, characters and, and digits. While the image on the right shows how significant features are learned by the ANN to provide complex boundaries. And that concludes our video. This course was created as a part of the Stanford Crowd Course Initiative, the world's first massive online open coursework developed entirely by an online community. If you'd like to learn more about us or view more courses, visit crowdcourse.stanford.edu.